we go. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody in between, welcome once again to the Sin Shop Podcast. I am, of course, the Mighty Pong. And I'm Crux. And on tonight's show, we are going to be uh, uh, talking about drones. We're going to have uh, Jed and John from the uh, uh, from Praxis Aerospace. I didn't put it on the screen. Did that from memory. Yeah. But uh, we're going to be talking all about drones tonight. And uh, the FAA has done some some new uh, uh, legal rules and red and uh, and uh, and regulations. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about that in just a, just a short short second here. But before we do that. A uh, quick announcement on the shop. Now, the Sin Shop is, uh, you know, that's who we're doing the show on behalf of. Uh, it's a uh, maker hacker space located in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, now, we do offer tools and equipment that you can use to make pretty much whatever you can think of. Now, we're currently closed for renovation, so you're going to have to wait just a little bit to come check out the shop. However, our, uh, our members are currently working as hard as they can to get the shop back in action just as soon as they can. Uh, now, the uh, if you're in the Las Vegas area and you'd like to help, Join our Discord and check out the Shop Buildout channel to see what you can do to help get the shop back in action. Now, to join our Discord, just go to sinshop.org forward slash Discord to find the latest information on the shop. And to make sure you're notified of our future events, including virtual ones just like this one, you can join us at meetup.com forward slash sinshop. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our guests here. Uh, so let's see. First of all, in, uh, in the lower right, uh, we've got John, uh, founder and CEO of Praxis Aerospace. We get that up there on the screen there. FA. Okay, so man, this is a lot of title here. Okay, <laughs> CEO of Praxis Aerospace, FAA Safety Team Drone Pro, designated airworthiness re representative, and all-around drone czar. Well, there you go then. <laughs> I, we're not even charging extra for that. How you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Thank you. Yeah, we end up wearing a lot, a lot of hats. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and, and speaking of, of a lot of hats here, up in the uh, upper right corner there, we've got uh, Jed, who is the CTO of Praxis Aerospace, a longtime board member of the shop uh, as well. Uh, so uh, how long have you been, been going to the shop, Jed? I was trying to figure that out a little while ago. It's got to be at least three or four years. or four. It's got to be at least four years because... We were in the old space for five years, right? I believe so. So, uh, I started going just after they moved there. So, wow, and yeah. it, feels like longer, doesn't it? it no, I, honestly, it doesn't. It feels like mm -hmm. like a couple of years tops that I've been going to the shop. It's 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 so weird. So, uh, I my standard question for anybody who's a member of the shop: What's your favorite thing about it? The podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Duh. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, I mean, this is the place to be clearly, but, uh, so you, you end up wearing a lot of hats though. Like, uh, like John was saying. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, here I'm acting as CTO of, uh, for Praxis. Um, but, uh, my day job is a, uh, I do network security consulting for a, uh, IT consultancy outside of New York city. Very cool. And, uh, and then, yeah, I've been a board member here at the shop and, you know, try to, fool around with all kinds of technologies and interesting stuff as most of us do. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so, so speaking of, of what you guys do, I guess let's go ahead and get, get right into it. So Praxis Aerospace, I almost said Praxis Airlines. I'm not sure if I said that in the, in the intro, but anyway, Praxis Aerospace. So what do you guys do? Got it. Uh, so this is a, a mouthful. So we're a multimodal robotics consulting company. Uh, okay. So if a crawl walks, flies, or swims, we're willing to grab it and, and tackle it. And usually we help with with uh, prototyping or some of the regulate regulation uh, compliance aspects, and, and helping people get get some an idea and turn it into a, an actual product and get it out there on the street. Uh, one of the other things, and this has kind of helped us during COVID, is you know we manage the only commercial drone port in Nevada uh, at a searchlight. Uh, so. Oh, no kidding. Uh, one, yeah, not the one in Fallout Vegas, but that's completely wrong, but the actual Searchlight uh, airfield itself. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, wait, is, so Searchlight, that's the one, oh, that's the one that's like underground, isn't it? <laughs> only on the video game. Yeah, only yeah. The video game. In, yeah. in Fallout Vegas. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's awesome. So so you, you, you said uh, anything that uh, runs, flies, or... or... Something else, or walks, yeah, or crawls, crawls, or walks, flies, or swims. There you go. Uh, so we we we've tackled with those and had clients with those uh, yeah. from commercial space 
uh, all the way down to uh, the self-driving cars. And um, we did a really neat challenge back in 2015 where uh, we taught a, a humanoid robot how to drive a truck, a little UTV thing. Oh, and uh, that was that was our project. Of, it was a much larger, larger program, but that was our piece. And, okay. and we did the best at that of everybody. Uh, and we had Car- Carnegie Mellon, MIT, those sort of things competing as well. So I think I, most of the people here are familiar with the DARPA Robotics Challenge, aka Robots Falling Down. Oh yeah, that was <laughs> it, well, it was five years ago. I'm I'm barely familiar yeah, yeah. with it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, usually it's funny you mentioned that you know you, you'll you'll tackle any of those. Usually, you only have to tackle it when it goes wrong. So it sounds like a <laughs> that's usually when we get called. Is uh, somebody's figured out either they run out of money or they have an idea they don't know what to do with. Uh, okay. uh, and, that's, and that's when they come to us and and go from there. So. Hey, so if a robot becomes, let's just say, sentient and starts <laughs> taking over the place, just hypothetically, how soon could you be here? <laughs> I, I, was, I have actually had that conversation. No. Uh, we've had a lot of conversation about neural net, some of the discussions being uh, brought up about robo ethics and decision making. Uh, I wish I was kidding because some of them I just sit there going, you didn't do that. And then nice try. Uh, and then others, it's a. All right, hold on. Let's back up a second. <laughs> in context. Tell me again what you think just happened, and, and we'll go from there. Oh wow, um, it, it's it, it is fun. I mean, it's one of the things I like about what we do. Oh, man, that's uh, okay. So later on, later. I don't know if this will be a post game thing or what, but, <laughs> but later on, I have to ask you uh, about that thing in Soma. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just put it like that. Uh, there's a uh, okay. I'll get. I'll, I'll do. I'll do that. Later. I should say. Stay on target. <laughs> Stay on t- it's not easy. It's, there, there's a, you got all kinds of stuff to, to talk about. All right, so let's get to it. So how long have you guys been around? It sounds like you've been been doing things for a while. Yes. So I moved back here, or I moved here in 2006, uh, right after Jed left. It was kind of funny. And then um, in 2011 is when we actually formed the company. Mm-hmm. And so we, we've, been, we've been here since then. Uh, and, and you were talking about the Sin Shop. I actually visited the Sin Shop in the old location downtown for a drone day back in, I want to say, uh, like 2014. Wow. And so I, I just before you had moved, but I, I do remember that. Uh, Was that, that when so, they were doing the drone races at the Neonopolis across the street? So I've done, I, I've, I've been to those. Uh, no, this was, um, I want to say it was, it was like right outside the door. We walked outside the danger room and right outside was where there, there were flights. And I remember lots of wires and lots of equipment and, uh, and things around and, uh, I was there with one of the other founders and two of us were looking at it like, this is really cool, but I'm not, I'm not sure if we should be doing this. <laughs> so it was, well, it was a good old days of, uh, Hey, well, let's do it and see what happens. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess so on, on that topic. Uh, so the FAA recently have changed their rules around a little bit. Um, yeah. and, and that was, you know, I don't know if that's, if that was you guys' fault, I mean, maybe somebody was at the uh, at Neonopolis and we're like, "Hey, you know, <laughs> where are these guys up to?" No, but uh, so on December the twenty uh, December twenty eighth, uh, the FAA announced final rules for unmanned aircraft systems. This is from their website: um, uh, unmanned aircraft systems or drones that will require remote identification of drones and allow operators of small drones to fly over people at night uh, under certain conditions. So. There was there was so there's basically two parts of that just to kind of break it apart here. Uh, the remote ID being first. So what's how does remote ID work? In what kind of you know how does right. uh, how does it work? Yeah. So so this this was a big rule change, right? And okay. it's something we've been looking forward to since 2016 when the the small UAS rule was first published, uh, and and we've been working on on a lot of these. Um, and, and I'll tell you later, but th- this is partly our fault. I was I was part of the rulemaking committee. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so basically, remote ID is, is an electronic license plate, right? So the idea is that your your unmanned aircraft is telling uh, broadcasting your serial number, uh, lat long and altitude, what time you're flying, uh, where the control station is, and oh, wow. and whether you're in an emergency or not. And and that way, that's broadcast out. Um, now, what you can receive and and what the the public receives is basically the license plate, mm-hmm. right? So special authorized users. Uh, we'll be able to tap into the database and get the rest of that information. Oh wow! And and that's and that's where things start to to kind of get interesting. Absolutely, yeah. So so the information you said you said it was like emergency. Uh, let's see, was there a drone? Oh, uh, real puking monkey in the chat says, was there a drone weight limit on the rules? 
Um, it is, there is a weight limit, but it's the rule weight limit of 55 pounds. Uh, so that's the key piece. So part 107, which is a small UAS rule is 55 pounds or less than 55 pounds. Uh, there are other rules for over 55 pounds that this applies to, uh, but the, the big focus for 107 is the 55 pounds or less. So when you say 55 pounds, that's the total weight, including fuel of the unit, or is that how much it can carry or what is that? Everything you put on it, when you say pick it up off the ground, cannot exceed or cannot equal 55 pounds. It has to be less. Got it. Okay. And, and we've done a couple, you know, we're sitting there at 44, you know, 54.9997 and we're like, don't breathe. <laughs> so, uh, but it is that 55 pounds is the limit for there. Wow. So what you said that, that one of the things that was on there is, are you in an emergency? So now right. how does the drone or how does the chip on the drone, I'm guessing, know whether you're in, a, in an emergency? What's that about? So that is part of the implementation challenge. And there's a couple of industry standards that are out there uh, that help work with that. But the, the general idea is much like when you're driving your car, you can pull a hazard light, and let people know there's, an, you know there's a challenge, or you're parked in the road and they can see you there. Uh, the idea is that the the new the new drones will have something that set, that can recognize I'm no longer being controlled, right? We see it now when we're we're out flying. Mm. Uh, for anybody who's flying, you get a lost link, and it tells you, or it's just like losing the bars in your cell phone. You know, it identifies there's no link, and that is a a partial emergency. Or if the engines stop working and other things happen, it will let you know there's a there's an emergency, and it broadcasts that. And, and part of that is actually for uh, for you, uh, the remote pilot. Because if you're doing something illegal, right, and somebody mm -hmm. goes, hey, why are you flying so fast or why are you flying dangerously? Yeah. If it's an emergency, you're allowed to do that, uh, okay. right? Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're allowed to break certain rules in order to, uh, to you know, get yourself out of the emergency and mitigate possible damage. Hmm. Uh, additionally, the FAA has recognized that if the, if the drone's out of control, um, you are unable to control it. Therefore, there's some... Uh, you know, understanding there uh, when it comes down to the compliance action afterwards of, look, you couldn't, you couldn't control it. So we're going to lessen the penalty and, and figure out what you could control and go from there. Oh, wow. Well, that's, that's kind of good then. So right, there'd so be a difference between intentionally crashing into something versus, you know, it lowing out of control and then yeah. right. crashed. <laughs> and, and with, with the way they're, they're implementing it. So the, there's two versions of this. Uh, that come out. And and one is that in, in about 18 months, um, in September of 2022, mm -hmm. every drone manufactured in the United States, whether it's unassembled or not, has to have a built-in remote ID system. Okay. Right. It has to be built in by the manufacturer at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that point, it will be illegal to fly anything without, uh, or illegal to fly some, uh, or illegal to build a system that doesn't have a, a drone ID. A year later, mm -hmm will be the, it'll be illegal to fly anything, whether you have built it yourself or you bought it, mm. that doesn't have a, a remote ID module. So there's a, a special rule for the aftermarket module yeah. that uh, it doesn't have where your control station is, but it tells everybody where you took off, right? So it, it's, it's passed out. I took off from this location I'm flying. Again, the idea is that, um, you know, it, it, it's broadcasting information and it's a way we can all uh, we can all fly there and it tells other people what's happening. So if I'm flying a helicopter or we're going to land at McCarran or something, uh, the idea is that if there's an emergency, I have some notice, whereas normally there's, there's no way to figure that out. Hmm. What about in the situations where like I've, I've seen some of these, uh, uh, their, uh, their drones that have cameras on them that follow you, like you wear like an armband or something like that. And it follows you while you're jumping off a mountain or whatever, you know, yep. like, like, uh, what about for those, the place where you take off isn't necessarily the place where the operator is going to be. Right. So, uh, there's some implementation challenges, yeah. uh, that will go in there. You know, we, um, it, one of the things we, we've, we've done down at searchlight, uh, is, you know, we had, we have a, a beyond visual line of sight waiver and we can fly over with moving vehicles. Uh, and there's been a couple of times where we, we did a, a five mile loop where uh, we tossed the drone out, took it off, and then drove the Jeep 25 miles an hour up and down trails while mm -hmm. it followed us. Oh, and wow. when you look at some of those remote ID issues, it will be a lot of fun because if, if we had the, the the category standard remote ID module, uh, it will be constantly updating. Okay, here's how fast the ground control station is, here's fa how fast the aircraft is. Oh, wow. And, and that will be really fun. I, I, I can't wait to talk to the first person who picks that up and 
tries to understand what happened. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So then Are you running the- while you're flying? Like, <laughs> no, we're in the Jeep. <laughs> no, yeah. so is this a, like a fully unencrypted protocol or are parts it, of it encrypted? It or? is. That, so that's part of the the, the challenge on, on the invitation. So they're, they're looking at using uh, an ASTM standard for remote ID uh, and the broadcast. But it, it is broadcast. Uh, right now they're looking at it's uh, a Bluetooth or a, a Wi-Fi waveform. Um, and, you know, a, a typical 0211 kind of thing. and the idea is that the the law enforcement can pick up the information from any system with without having to buy something new. So they're really trying to target it so that a, a standard smartphone can pick up this information. So they but backed they off on the whole ADSB uh, plans, huh? Actually, ADSB has been prohibited, uh, which which hurt us a little bit because we were ahead of that. What is um, ADSB? But it, sorry, yeah, <laughs> ADSB is what. The traditional aircraft use, right? So for the last 20 years, we've been modernizing transponders on, on airplanes and helicopters. And we finally got uh, in 20, uh, I want to say 2020 actually, is we, we finally got to the point where everybody had to have this new system called uh, ADSB, Automatic uh, automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, ADSB. Okay. Yeah. It's and, the equivalent for for um, for real aircraft, uh, commercial right. it, and, and uh, private aircraft. So that's it basically is, like the black box kind of. No, it's it's like remote ID, right? Oh. So it's basically remote ID, but for for man, you know, traditional manned aircraft. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thing that always broadcasts its location, and um, right. You know, we we have talked about it a little bit on the on the sh- uh, uh, at the shop with a couple of guys. We were talking about setting up a um, a receiver for ADSB so we can track real time flights near the near the shop because oh, we're right, right by the airport. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so that that's the same thing. And quite some time ago, that there was talk that the FAA would be requiring drones to have ADSB transponders, also, mm-hmm. which is convenient because then pilots don't have to do anything extra to receive this notification that there's a drone in that area. But it's inconvenient for drone owners because they have to go get special equipment that pilots right. are used to dealing with. Ah, right. okay. And and there there's a very powerful. It's a 30 watt transmitter. So when, when everything else you're using is half a watt or, or one watt or less, mm-hmm. and you've got this 30 watt transmitter for this, this transponder, uh, that has a habit of, of really goobering up uh, onboard electronics pretty well. Oh, wow. Um, we, we had a couple of them uh, that we put on some systems and we're, we're kind of doing some tests and experimenting on. Uh, and it was, it, it's a great system. It works really well. But for, you know, when you start talking a, a five pound drone, it will fry everything on board. Uh, and, and, and go through just, batteries you know, pretty quick too. And yes, that was the other piece, right? Because you're not used to that amount of power and amperage. It's just it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so this new rule actually specifically prohibits you cannot use ADSB unless you're flying an instrument flight plan, which is the same type of flight plan that airliners do. Oh, wow. uh, we don't have anything doing that yet. Um, there's one aircraft in North Dakota that can, hmm. and that's pretty much it in the country. So, wow. uh, yeah. Huh. Sorry, j- jump down in weeds there. <laughs> oh, no, no. That's, 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 that's I think for people who are following, I'm sure one person at least, Titans, hi, Ty, who's following the show, um, knows at least a little bit about the ADSB and was asking me specifically, I think, a while ago. So, yeah. that's, uh, Actually, speaking of Titans, uh, he uh, in the chat said uh, just a second ago, the ADSB receivers are a lot of fun to watch. I had no idea that the drone transponders were something separate. So, I, I yes. yeah. I, I almost wonder if part of that, in addition to the, the obviously the technical challenges, you know, the 30 watts and all that stuff, I imagine that part of that was also having to uh, upfit like police cruisers with equipment to get that information. It was. That was actually one of the big drivers behind a new ADSB or a new remote ID uh, rule mm-hmm. and, and have, have a different sa- uh, separate thing for it. The other thing was air traffic control because drones don't fly as fast as airliners. And when you look at how far they, they broadcast and the radar screens, you know, like the guys in Las Vegas, they pick everything up when it crosses the Mississippi and then bring them back into Las Vegas. Wow. So if you think that at the same point in time, because this is a, you know, it's a network solution, it's not just the transponders, but they, you know, you pick up what's near you and then you feed that information out to everybody else. Yeah. Basically, your screen would just turn white and never move. Oh man, yeah. So there was a lot of concern that it would be a, a big problem, and, and we, that's something that we, uh, you know, both on the rulemaking committee and, and in our 
uh, our work would would go talk to aircraft controllers and and do some of these experiments and work through them on you know what what does it really look like and like i said you know you have that little dot on a scope well if you have a thousand drones flying in one area yeah. it's just this big white dot over vegas or orlando or you know or denver and it doesn't do anybody any good mm. yeah yeah that's one of those points where where too much information is a really bad thing you know because if you got that many drones all together in the same place if you've got like an event where someone's doing drone races or something like that it's going to look like there's just a big airplane wouldn't it like almost well, it was, it's a big block because each one tell because the ADSP tells altitude and GPS as well. Oh, right. So what you have is this big giant overlapping set of entities that have constantly conflicting, changing data because you don't know which one's actually which unless oh, you yeah. zoom down. And the whole idea of being able to see from Mississippi to Las Vegas is that you're not zooming in. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And and that defeats the the purpose. So uh, the remote ID, you know, for all the different things we talked about, the size, weight, and power aspects. Uh, although the funny thing is that ADSB is also unencrypted, oh. uh, so th so that is that's another one of those you know the the issues that we we didn't have to deal with was that you can pull off information, get tail numbers, uh, and read it and go from there, and and you know it's relatively easy with a, a good little hack RF antenna. Uh, yeah, from a, a much more interesting perspective for some <laughs> of our uh, our listeners might be the fact that not only is it unencrypted, but it's also not uh sing signed in any way so i was going to ask can, about that you can broadcast saying i am tail number you know southwest yeah. 258 totally illegal and you know bad things will happen but it's very scary well you, yes. you're shaking your head about that no it, it's it's you can oh uh, the, the the issue is and, and and this is part of what we we just found out in discovery is if there is an airliner dot that is not moving and registers on the ground, not on an airport, mm -hmm. apparently emergency services get notified because that's not supposed to happen. Oh, yeah, that <laughs> right? is so a problem. The immediate assumption is that there was a crash because why is there an airliner not on the airport, not, you know, zero knots in, at one G of uh, acceleration? Why is this happening? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, no, someone needs to look into that. Right. I get it. Right. Yeah. It's also easy too. enough to spoof and say like, oh, there's 50 747s converging on Vegas right this second. Right. Wow. Uh, yeah. And so they take it pretty seriously. And, and we've gotten a couple of calls. I mean, it's one of the fun things about running the airport is that, you know, we've gotten calls of, you know, from the FAA. Hey, there's a there's a Mexican registered uh, airplane that, that's giving a distress call at your airport. Uh, is there anything out there? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we'll have somebody out there and it's like there's there's nothing here. But we have to check because they've notified the alert. And if we don't get a response in two hours, they notify it, you know, the satellites and the SAR and, and all this other stuff happens. Wow. So I would not recommend, even though it may sound like fun, anybody at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the FAA is surprisingly um, uh, scary when it comes to their enforcement. I believe it. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, it, it's. <laughs> now, yeah. Now, of course it, it, we, we, we here at the Sunshot Podcast are not offering legal advice. We are not lawyers, but if you mess around with the FAA, you're probably going to need one. So, yes, yeah. yeah. So, so that's interesting. So, so in order to be compliant, and let's say you know, I just went out, I built myself a, a, a drone. In order to be compliant, what do I need to buy? Is it like a little tiny unit that you buy and put inside the thing, and you're done? Or so right now. Um, they don't know the answer to that. We're, we're still trying to develop that for the on the implementation side. Um, we'll get there. And like I said, there's an ASTM standard that was was balloted before the rule came out. Uh, the FAA has some changes they want us to make in that. And um, you know, for anybody who doesn't know what ASTM is, ASTM is the oldest standards development organization in the world, uh, and they yeah. are the the US one. And yes, older we're really proud of that. I'm surprised. It is. It is. It is older than ANSI. It's uh, almost wow. 100 years old, which cracks me up. Wow. Um, but yeah, ANSI, ANSI is the, the American version uh, and the American tie-in to the International Standards Organization, and ASTM is a an ANSI-accredited uh, standards body. Um, wow. it, one of the other hats I wear is I'm actually a subcommittee chair for uh, one of the UAS standards, and then exoskeleton standards. Uh, I'm a subcommittee chair for one of those committees. Hold on. Point of order. <laughs> Point of order. <laughs> Did you just say? Yes. Did you just say exoskeleton chair? I I did, as a matter of fact. Um, okay. Yes, exo exoskeletons and exosuits is one of. Like I said, if it crawls, walks, flies, or swims, we probably got our hands in it. And and that was one of those things that uh, that we got wrapped into. 
We got okay. We definitely have to talk about that in the post game. My goodness. And I, I, in fact, I'll have to. Uh, we we got to talk about that if nothing, if for no other reason, just so I can tell you the lamest exoskeleton I've ever seen in my life. And I think you probably know what it is. We'll see. We'll see if you can guess in the post. I can't wait to hear. Um, so so the, the key is what well, you know. What is it you buy? It will actually get to the point where you'll be able to make it yourself, right? Uh-huh. So this will be a, a standard, just like again, just like Bluetooth, just like you have to You'll have the components you can buy and build it from there. And, and there'll be a process and a standard by which you, you do that. And we're just not not there yet. Uh, it should be any time within the next six months at the latest uh, that we have all that worked out. And yeah. again, we had to follow with the rule and, and all that from there. Hmm. Um, so have you had to like restart a lot of stuff with the you know current change in management that we're currently having? No. Really? Um, no, actually, it's it's been really great. Um, so the, the FAA... So the previous administration had a rule that for every new rule you pass, you had to get rid of two. Oh yeah, yeah. And and that is is uh, is still in effect, but it's being reviewed now. So these things that we've been working on, they put a lot of time and effort because, of, you know, when they put out a new rule, they had to get rid of two, and the one you put out better work. Oh God! <laughs> because oh, because if, if you change it's such it, a pain, yeah, it's such a pain to get in there. Oh so ops over people, the uh, the remote ID, you know, th- those rules that are put together uh, really got pushed through well. And, and there's a couple other um, rules that, that are also following on this uh, related to type certification, equipment certification, those sort of things, all of which are going to make it better and easier for us to, to do this. Yeah. And and that is the key part. But the remote ID was such an important piece because the they weren't going to let us fly over people until they've solved remote ID. So now that remote ID is solved in a rule, you know, solved. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and in a rule, we, we've got in place how we're going to fly over people as well. Okay. So how did how did they do? Well, I guess they didn't really come to think of it. I was thinking like, you know, there were some uh, uh, things for CES, not this, not the past one, but when there was actually people um, <laughs> for, uh, they, they did all these displays with network drones and stuff like that, but they had a cordoned off area where they did it. Now that I think about so, it. So it's funny. One of the things that caught a lot of people by surprise with the actual rule yeah. was in the original concept, there was a network version and then there was the broadcast version. Yeah. And and the idea was with the network that maybe I didn't have a transmitter of my own, but, you know, my drone fed my control station. The controller jumped onto the, the cloud and gave information and everybody got the info from the cloud. Mm-hmm. And and that was there was a lot of companies to put a lot of money into into building that uh, that backbone and, and, and building that backbone. So when that wasn't supported by the rule, um, they had a pretty hard pivot. Uh, we've one of the things that, that we've been ahead of people on, uh, just the way we look at it, because uh, we we are a hardware software kind of looking company. Mm-hmm. Um, we want to touch it and break it, right? Sure. Is is the the infrastructure and and the fact that no matter what you know anything in the cloud still has some type of infrastructure. Where is that going to be? How are you going to get the information in there? And uh, you know we had already been looking at basically re- receivers, just like Jed talked about with the ADSB, mm-hmm. putting out remote ID receivers and using that to feed our own our own information. And so even now you can still do that under the new rule, but you have to figure out how to get, you know, ingest this data. And uh, and that's where it becomes important. So it's it is kind of a fun, you know, it, it's a fun nerdy thing to play yeah. with, right? I mean you, you got you got drones talking each other and robots talking each other while they're flying, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so where did they where did they put the split then? So are they still making it to where you have to have a trans a uh, uh, ID? So in? Right now, the current rule is you have to have this uh, the broadcast that has to be there. Uh, yeah. Either it's built in the system, and and I say right now with the current rule, the effective date is is eighteen months away. Okay. Uh, so if you build a new system, you have to build it with a remote ID broadcast, mm. and then in a year after that, if you fly a system, whether you built it or not you have to have remote ID or there's a third answer, which is you can fly in a special area where nobody has remote ID, but it's a special area that has permission. Hmm. Uh, and, th- and that's how they're going to bring in the, the flight parks, right? So all the recreational oh. uh, hobby parks have been out for, for 50, 60 years. That's how they're going to do those. Oh, okay. So like the same kind of fields you would go to for like model rocketry. Those are the same. Right. Yeah. Right. Same and and we're gonna we're gonna put one in at searchlight. We're just uh, that's that's one of the things we've been waiting on this as well. Oh, but okay. they're not even taking ex- uh, applications for this until 2022. Right. That makes so sense. we've got some time to work on it. <laughs> yeah. 
So, uh, yeah, I was going to ask about that. So it's like they're mandating this technology that actually isn't a thing yet? Like, because I can't go buy a thing to put inside the drone. That is That's what correct. the FAA does. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> Welcome to the world of the FAA. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Well, uh, speaking of, uh, of being welcome to places, welcome to the uh, the uh, top of the hour. Uh, just uh, real quick here, uh, we're uh, we're talking right now with with John and Jed, uh, the uh, CEO and CTO of Praxis Aerospace. Uh, this uh, this uh, show here is on behalf of the Sin Shop. Uh, Sin Shop is a makerspace located in uh, fabulous Las Vegas. And uh, to find out more information about the shop, you can head on over to sinshop.org. Also, uh, Titans in the chat earlier is going to be joining us on Monday, I believe. Crux will as well. You join us on? Yeah, I should be. Sweet. Uh, on Monday night for our project night, uh, we're going to be putting together some stuff. I'm going to be taking apart some stuff because I screwed it up last week. But uh, we're going to be uh, working on some projects. So come on and, and join us. Uh, same time, 730. And that's going to be on Monday night. Uh, more information about the shop, go to sinshop.org. And for more information about uh, upcoming events, including virtual ones just like this, head on over to meetup.com forward slash sinshop. Uh, <laughs> as far as the uh, identification areas, you covered those. Do right. people have to uh, purchase uh, the, like, do, do people have to purchase a license in order to use it? Do you have to, like, register it or like how does that work so, so yes but okay. um right so there's there's for the most part uh if you have a a remote pilot certificate under mm -hmm. part 107 then that is your your license to fly um you have to register each aircraft under part 107 uh separately however there is a a recreational exemption uh something called a 44809 and that if you, if you meet these eight tests, then you can you can fly without a license and, and you have some authority. Mm. Um, the challenge that most people run into is if you don't meet those eight tests at any point and it can be retroactively applied that you don't meet them, mm. then you're found in violation of Part 107. And everything that you violated in 107, starting with didn't have a license, didn't register properly, it just goes downhill from there. So one of the things I like to I like to remind people and bring up is that um, you know it only costs about a hundred dollars to get a license. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you do some you can do some self studying. There's a lot of great free uh, free stuff out there on the net, mm -hmm. and then you go take your license and and now you've just saved yourself um, a, a lot of money. Should anything go wrong, you can still have fun and fly recreationally, um, but you've just saved yourself a lot of those other issues. Uh, and a great example of that is, is, you know, I know we're going to talk a little bit more later about the enforcement and compliance. You know, every violation of the, 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 the rule per paragraph starts at about $15,000 of violation. Whoa. Yeah, that's so not it, it's, it's not good. And especially, you know, it's, it's the FAA has been lenient on some of their enforcement when you're recreational, if you're just flying for fun. Oh, but okay. if you've crossed that line where, you know, I'm taking pictures for a realtor or I put it on my YouTube channel. Oh. Um, that gets into commercial and they are not leaking <laughs> at all. Oh boy. Okay. That, yeah. That's or, that's where the hammer comes. And so here's where it gets really nasty is you fly a drone today and you take some beautiful pictures of, you know, sunsets in the Vegas Valley. Mm -hmm. And five years from now, somebody says, Oh, those are great. You should put them up here and you know, sell them as prints. Well, now you've retroactively changed what you did and the you know, they can theoretically come in and talk to you about having made some money off of it so so there's actually a case of this happening right now with a guy in pittsburgh where they've been going through as part of the uh the complaint process all of his youtube videos and you know wayback machine archives whoa <laughs> using all of that as an example of of how he what his you know repeated remorseless Oh, violations wow. and and patterns so uh again uh, we actually gave it for free I, as part of being a drone pro that's a, an faa program we yeah. actually gave a, a three-hour webinar on how to get your 107 license for a hundred dollars wow <laughs> and and there's a lot of free education available from the faa about that uh it just saves everybody a lot of time and money 
<laughs> I mean, I guess the good side of it is at least they made it affordable. Like if you're if you can afford right. a drone, you can afford a hundred bucks. Like, well, and, and they actually just got a lot better. So one of the other changes in these rules mm -hmm. is it used to be every two years you had to go back and retake the test at a hundred dollars. Okay. And and now come March, you will not have to go retake the test for at a testing center. You can go online and do the FAA training. Hmm. And that gives you another two years. So, um, so that was that was a big thing that that changed, and we're pretty happy about that too. Oh, absolutely. So, what is the testing like? Is it do you have to like fly between the cones or like you know, how does it, that? It's not a flight test at all. Actually, it is completely a knowledge based exam. You can you can get the Part One Hundred Seven certification without ever having flown or even touched a drone. That'd be I, I think my one of my favorite examples uh, is I met an instructor who you know she had been a uh, a helicopter pilot and became a drone pilot and was a drone in, in, uh, instructor, right? And if you have a pilot's license, the FAA will actually not even make you take the exam. You can go mm -hmm. take something online, provided you've flown your, 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 whatever your aircraft is in two years, you just take an online exam and you get your license, right? You get your remote pilot certificate. Mm -hmm. And she never flew. She would just stand next to somebody else and talk them through maneuvers. At oh, like wow. 200 bucks a, a session or something like that. Oh, wow. And, and just like, this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to buy anything. They own it. They come to me. We sit down and teach them. It's great. Yeah. And so so there's, there's, there are some issues and challenges there. There's a couple of programs that actually have a flight test. Um, there's a, a public safety program where, where you know, from my NIST uh, and FEMA, where you actually have to do certain things. And it, it is kind of like a little jungle gym you put them through. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a couple of voluntary compliance programs where you basically fly an obstacle course and, and just show that you can do those maneuvers. Um, but those are for people who want to go above and beyond. And, and But the basic FAA requirement is you take a, a, a knowledge exam. Cool. So so before we get into the compliance uh, end of things, Titan <laughs> is asking, uh, did RC plane and RC helicopter uh, owners have to go through this? Uh, so that is one of the other changes there is going to be a knowledge requirement for RC for any hobbyist. You're going to have to take a knowledge exam. Mm. Um, the their intent right now, and and there's a couple of different you know companies that have been working with this. Um, it's not going to be through a testing center like a the remote pilot certificate because you can do commercial work that way. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be through just an instructor, or, or there's going to be a couple of of entities that actually allow you to do it. Uh, DJI for a while was actually talking about putting the tutorials. So the first time you fire up the DJI drone, uh, you have to go through all the tutorials and get the training before oh. you can start it. No, oh. uh, and and they were looking at some methods like that, um, but they are they, there's a lot of concern. You know, National Drone Safety Awareness Week in November was focused on recreational. Uh, right now, it's something like 80% of all violations are people who are are recreational flyers who just haven't caught up with the new rules. Mm -hmm. So there there is a lot of attention on on RC helicopter and airplane fly, fly, flyers. So if you're just if you're just some dude and you just got a drone for Christmas and you're out in a field like well I guess that kind of leads into compliance like how <laughs> how is that how is that maintained you know like I I was joking around in the in the show notes you know are there police drones with lights sirens and a drop net that come up and like <laughs> there are uh, oh. so so just talking about Las Vegas right so we'll okay. use our little microcosm as an example yeah so. The Las Vegas Valley uh, down the strip has a very intensive drone detection system in place that runs 24 seven. Really? Uh, you know, Metro has one of the more robust drone programs of any police department in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're very active. In fact, one of the Metro officers is coming on board as a, a drone pro to kind of help with that um, because there's an education part of enforcement, right? We want to, would much rather give everybody an education warning than just through the fines. Mm -hmm. um, so, but they've very happily gone out and captured people who fired up their drone and were picked up on the system and didn't know. And you use a great example of, hey, I got a drone for Christmas. I opened it up, went and flow. Um, the challenge there is I talked about those eight tests. Yeah. Well, one of, one of those eight things is that you're following a community-based organization standards like AMA or drone user group. Mm. If you just bought it at a store and just opened it up, nine times out of 10, you're not following that either. So you've just killed one of the eight and now you're a violation of 107. Oh, wow. It's, it really is a, you know, we, we've been working really, really hard Yeah. Uh, to get people to understand that, you know, this isn't, 
it's not what you can just open up and go fly anymore. It really is uh, a, a pretty big rule change on that. And and the FAA, I actually, uh, as a drum pro, um, you know, I was talking about some of the, the compliance aspects. So we had a couple of people who were, were caught. Mm-hmm. And as part of their, uh, their remedial um, education, they had to get drone pro uh, led training. So we gave a couple of webinars. We went through those things and, and educated them. And, and one of the guys was just like that, you know, Hey, I just bought it, thought it would be go, will be fun. And, uh, ended up, you know, was, well, I was on the strip and what the heck. And, oh. uh, next thing you know, he's got a nice visit from a, an FAA guy with a badge. <laughs> wow. And a couple of weeks later, we're sitting just like this going, okay, so let's talk about what the rules are and what those yeah. eight tests are and how you get there. Um, so uh, if they come across that, that guy, like, you know, if he, if he's like a, you know some kid with a with a drone they're not going to slap that on the kid and his parents are they it's the kid actually uh Whoa. so part of the challenge because that's the thing yeah. remote pilot under the rule under part 107 the remote pilot is 100 percent responsible right uh, it's actually one of the challenges that companies have because even if i own a company yeah right and you know well i do own a company right so if jed's flying for my company jed is still 100 percent responsible for what he does mm. right and then it's only secondary that the splashback gets to the company because it's probably our equipment and all those things. But if I gave Jed bad equipment and he went and flew it, mm-hmm. he gets 100% and then I get 100% on the, the liability side for something different. Mm-hmm. But he's the one who's going to go to jail or get the fine. Wow. And and that's the... I'm totally the, selling you out, dude. I'm cutting a deal. <laughs> I'm not going to jail for you. Sorry, pal. And I can get you right they, to the boss. I can get you the main guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so, so part of what we, that's part of what we do. I talked about how we, we help people with the regulations and compliance. So we yeah. do that with really large aircraft, but the largest one we've done is 1200 pounds mm-hmm. um, and, and gotten them certified and up and flying. Um, but we, we help people with that. And like I said, on a, on a side note, another hat is trying to help recreational people and, and just not be dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is, that is a huge challenge, right? Is okay. So kids flying, what do you do? Well, the kid's going to, you know, be responsible for it. Um, the adult, you know, if they're under 13, cause 13 is the age, uh, if you're under 13, then, then yes, the adult gets hit with it for being responsible, but that 13 year old kid could actually get fined for a violation of a federal law. You know, then, now again, it, de- it depends on what it is, right? If, it, you know, if the guy shows up and that's one of the things in the rules, right? So the rule, you have to show your certificate, show your registration, now show a photo ID, uh-huh. right? So you have to be by federal law. You have to be ready to do that starting March 1st. Wow. And, you know, so if you don't, it's one thing, you know, we all know the deal, right? If I'm just ignorant, I'm like, I didn't know. Um, that's usually better if I'm there going, you know, off the man that, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that, that doesn't end well. Yeah. It just, it just escalates. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we've had a very good, you know, friendly relationship with the FAA for, for many years. Um, but even then, it's, you know, there's, it's really great. And, uh, you know, I, I, I learned a long time ago, though, that I don't willingly open up my manuals, even if I just want to show them an example of something, because every time I've done that, they're like, oh, that's cool. Hey, what does this mean over here? And how come it's not written like this? Uh, don't look at that. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's just one of those sort of things where that's the FAA is really serious about. We have one of the safest airspace systems in the world. Yeah. And, and it's because the FAA is so conservative. Uh, and the, the the problem, and they'll tell you this if you if you call them, there are eight thousand people who apply for waivers and authorizations, and seven thousand nine hundred ninety six of them don't know what they're doing. Oh boy! And and that's their their big fear, and that's always been the challenge, and and part of where where things have been such a problem. So now that we've had five, you know four years of of a rule where people are supposed to know better, right? It's, you can't say it's new anymore. You can't yeah. say you didn't know. It's been four years. Mm-hmm. Now things are starting to, to escalate to the point of, you know, it's uh, it's kind of like the click it or ticket, right? You know, when they first started making everybody wear seatbelts, eh, hey, you know, we have a new rule. You need to be careful. Now it's, I saw you three blocks ago and you didn't have your seatbelt on, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the same, thing, the same thing's happened on the FAA. Okay. Well, I mean, hopefully not the selective enforcement part, but yeah, I get what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I would say I would call it selective enforcement. There's an educational piece of, you know, one, the gradient of what you're doing. Yeah. Obviously, if you're flying over a prison and you're breaking all these rules, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a no. Just give it yeah. up, right? If you're in your backyard and and you didn't know, there, there's a great spot in Vegas at IKEA. Oh yeah, right. So you have the giant IKEA parking lot, and then there's a a lot 
behind it, and then you have the highway. Yeah. That lot is just outside the uh, the restricted space, or not restricted space, but the, the controlled airspace in Las Vegas that you can't fly in. Ah. But if you get in that huh. parking lot and you launch over the other side of that fence, you can fly around, have all kinds of fun. Mm -hmm. And you are just outside of that. So if, if you're outside doing what you're supposed to, and it just so happens with the wind that blows it across the fence for a brief second, mm -hmm. you know, that's a different type of violation than if you're, you know, sitting on sunset, watching it whip up and down McCarran. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That would be bad. Right. Yeah. So again, I, I wouldn't call it selective enforcement. It's they're out there looking and that's what they do. They get a notification on their phone. I was actually talking to one, uh, one of the inspectors. And while I'm talking to him, his phone alert goes off, you know, unauthorized drone reported at, and it reads a coordinate. And he was like, oh, got to go. <laughs> wow. So it, how, do they, how do they find him? Is it the radio signal or, oh, is this? Is no, this it, it is. It, it is. I, I, I can talk about it because uh, it's, it's relatively public knowledge how they do it here. Um, but there is a lot of, you know, it is some, some basic radio finding. And uh, much like, you know, we talked about, they're unencrypted. So. Uh, there is a a drone manufacturer that has a large stake in the U.S., even though it's taken a few hits in the last year, mm. um, who happens to sell a system that says anybody flying our company's drones, it broadcasts this information to you, uh, and you can you can read it from there. Mm. And you know it, it's kind of like your cell phone. You know your cell phone company knows who you are and where you are. Yes. Um, it, and if they gave that information, that you know it, they have it right. So it, it's not that hard. Uh, and drones, drone manufacturers, a couple of them are, are getting in that. Uh, the other ones are based on radar, and, and I've seen acoustic sensors and, and light-based sensors and, and, and LIDAR and that sort of thing. Uh, and they all get really tricky because most of these things are, are really small. And, uh, you know, even, even with the fact that they're, they're made out of metal and they've got lithium you know, batteries and those sort of things, you know, it's not a really big radar cross-section. So you've got, you've got to really, you know, target it pretty smart. Uh, and it's kind of a neat thing. Uh, so they're they're working on that. It's not perfect. Um, a lot of it's refocused or repurposed fish finders. So if you ever use the radar on a boat, yeah, I love this. Use a radar on a boat. The way a lot of fish finders work is they look for the birds that are flying over the fish. Get out of here! I, I wish I, I. We have had again. We've had some weird clients. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and we were looking at some maritime radar frequencies and some things like that. Okay. Right. And, and it was, as we were going through, somebody wanted to repurpose it. And that was, you know, they had a marine radar they wanted to bring on the, on the ground and see if they could use. So we had to, to go through some things with them for that. Um, but when we went through the, the operation and how the system worked, that was actually how it worked. Because I was asking, like, how are you getting radar to find fish? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, that just doesn't work. Right. And they said, well, this is how we pick it up. And this is the, the way it works. So they're trying to use something similar to that for, uh, for drones is, you know, just like you huh. pick up these birds, how do we pick up the drones? But then we get into the whole FCC thing with what frequencies you're allowed to use. And uh, that that's a really fun one. Uh, you know, it's it's fun in the give me a whiteboard and a lot of coffee and we can argue for hours about how it should be done. <laughs> wow. <laughs> kind, of, kind of way. Um, yeah. but, but there's a lot of ideas out there of what to do. And as we're starting to use LTE based modems and as we're using Wi-Fi based modems and Bluetooth, you know, there's the Wi-Fi beacon and, and those sort of things that we know are there. Just most people don't realize they're there. So it's really not that hard. Yeah. Wow. Sorry, I've gone way off topic. Again. No, no, no. You're right on topic. No, absolutely. No. So uh, the, uh, the uh, oh, man, we're, we're barely to the uh, to the first half of the show and the shows the, the main show is almost over. So we're gonna right. we're gonna take a lot of this stuff into the post game here in about ten minutes. And uh, and you were afraid we wouldn't have enough content. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I was talking when I was talking to Jed earlier in the week. He was like, "I don't know. You think this is gonna be enough?" I'm like, "I'm pretty sure." It's gonna be enough. We're gonna be fine. Yeah, mm -hmm. but imagine if I was trying to make up answers for this because I don't know any of this stuff. I just I know about the technical details, and you know, oh. I can tell you the challenges right. of putting you know, various antennas on a, on a drone, but I stay away from all the rules and stuff. I'm, I'm more about breaking the rules than, than, uh, knowing what they are. Well, I, theoretically in Minecraft, he's, he, he's just, just hell on. No, we, we've actually, <laughs> no, we've, no, actually I mean, done okay. that. Yeah, we've been allowed to do that. That's the oh, things that we, yeah. we've That's, looked at more through of, you know, how do we do this? How does this work? And, uh, you know, it's, you've got to know how to break something in order to know how to fix something. Sometimes. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's awesome. it's a fun area to apply our um, you know, infosec security knowledge and OSINT 
knowledge to uh, to be trying to uh, exploit various things. Maybe you know sometimes it's it's figure out how would somebody who's malicious try to exploit something. Yeah. Others is how will somebody who's just an idiot exploit it and break it. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, well, we're, we're certainly going to get into the technical end of things in the in the post game for sure, because I got right. the, the, the clueless, the careless and the criminal. Right. And, and mm-hmm. the, the sad part is everybody worries about the criminal. And a lot of a lot of the remote ID was based on these these fear mongering that all oh, the criminals, you know, they're going to put a grenade on this thing and fly mm-hmm. it. Right. Yeah. And, you know, what about a pound of C4? How much damage is that going to be? And like, uh, unless you watch Hollywood, that's not really it. Yeah. You know, and then and then I made the mistake of, you know, I, I had a TSA agent in our office. and I was like, well. If you really want to be scared, I'd be scared of, and I detailed something relatively easy. And he kind of sat there going, "Has that happened?" I'm like, "Well, yeah, actually, there's it's happened seven times in these locations, but we don't we don't really, you know, that's the stuff that keeps you up at night." And he kind of sat there going, "I don't like talking to you," <laughs> <laughs> you know. And, and it's one of those those huh. things where you know, and, and these are the fun conversations we used to have in the shop back when uh, when we were all in there every day. Yeah, you know, was okay, well, how would you do this? Or how would you look at that? And it, and it is, it's, it's, it's the fun part of breaking things and, and getting there just so we can figure out how to, how to deal with that. And, you know, when people come with these uh, crazy, you know, I hate to say it, but we've, we've dealt with some uh, interesting interpretations of facts over the last few years. Oh, I can't wait and, to and some, sometimes people let their, let their feelings and fears really get a hold of them. And we've had a lot of that in the drone community. Uh, I, I, when I was on the rulemaking committee from Road ID, uh, so was Brendan Schulman from DJI, right? Okay. And we did a demonstration, went up to a demonstration in Virginia, and they tested a bunch of remote ID things. And on the way back, uh, somebody stopped their car in front of Brendan. I'm trying to get back in his rental car and started yelling at him about his Chinese drones that were sniffing his credit card numbers out of his wallet while they flew overhead. God. And and he and Brendan just came back, you know, you can see him, he was he was shook and you know, like, I can't believe this. You know, the guy's sitting there yelling at me. And I went, that's brilliant. And every time I talk to him, I bring that up. <laughs> because like that, you know, if you could do that, that would be amazing. And what a great challenge for, for FinTech and all these other things to go look at. Yeah. But it, it, it's one of those things that almost borders on the absurd because yeah. we know that's not the way it works. Right. Yeah. Right? They, they do that with the space lasers. Right. Yeah. You're, you're, reading, you're reading the chip, you know, my, my RFID chip on my, my credit card. Yeah. Not at a hundred feet and right. you know, no, we're not doing this or we're not doing that. And, and while I've had a love hate relationship with DJI, um, you know, that was one of those points where I was like, Hey, I, I'm really feeling for you mm-hmm. because that, that was absolutely ridiculous. You know, we're, we're right there next with the, uh, you know, and, and one of the other guys told me, he said, yeah, just tell him he's safe with his foil hat, you know, <laughs> wrap your foil around your wallet. You'll be good. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it is, it, it was a lot of that fear mongering. I hate to say a lot of that fear mongering people who are trying to sell these systems and, and trying to get them, them funded, uh, were really, really, really scaring people and mm-hmm. scared the, uh, the Homeland security and, and, and police and law enforcement in the country. And that drove a lot of this. Wow. Um, there are some real things to be afraid of, and I'm not going to talk about them on here. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there really are, and, and and Jed and I have 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 not only demonstrated those for some people who got really scared, um, and as one of the fun things we we enjoy. But it's you know in these conversations, okay, if we want to be real, let's go look at this. But the whole regulation problem is is that you can't, I can't sit there and tell you, uh, you know exactly what we're going to protect against, and make illegal, because I basically just told you how to do it, right? right. Yeah. But so if I you know if I say that that you know. Uh, you know, peppermint patties are illegal because, you know, they they cause tooth decay. Well, then everybody's going to go, well, if I want tooth decay, I'm going to eat peppermint patties, right? Or, or, right, or right. something to that effect. Yeah. And, and now peppermint just, patties, just... the better example is peppermint patties are illegal because if you boil them down with this soda, it will make meth. Mm. Yeah, but, there you go. You know, this, and, you know, this bottle here is only for cleaning your VHS heads. Right. If exactly. you inhale Not... it. It, exactly. Yes. You know, it, it could it, have it's, a, it's a fuel filter, yes. right? Yes. So, and, and we've seen, we've seen that. And that's one of the challenges. Yeah. Um, but I don't know was anything lot, about that. I know it, it was a lot of, a lot of fear along those lines that scared people and, and they're all tied together. Right. So when you deal with law enforcement, they're dealing with a whole bunch of other things. Yeah. They hear the same scary, everything they want to make a, you know, do something about it. 
and drones are a great way. Um, and, and drones were a great real target for that. And then we had we had real world examples, right? So there was a lot of stuff going on in the Middle East where guys were were three D printing, uh, you know, shuttlecocks to go on on munitions and drop them using oh. DJI drones. Oh. Um, there were uh, there was the Maduro att- assassination attempt where it showed exactly how spectacularly putting a bomb on a drone and flying it into a city doesn't work. Um, oh. Why you know? Well, can you say why it doesn't? Work oh yeah, the, there, there's there's great videos on it. I mean, one of one of them, I think they had three of them. One hit a uh, a power line between buildings and and fell and blew up. Oops. Uh, another one was uh, was detected and, and shot by the security, and then uh, the third one it had some other data link failure, uh, and when it finally detonated, it was too far away to actually do anything. Um, so it, it's yeah, it, it's it's it looks really good in the movie. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, but it doesn't work in real life. Wow. You know, shotguns don't blow people back 20 feet and no. grenades aren't, you know, big giant flame balls. And, uh, you know, when car crashes, it doesn't explode. You know, right. well, there's some reality in there that um, that people didn't quite see, but they were scared on. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. So that drove a lot of a lot of the remote ID fear. Um, and, you know, that's kind of where, where we're at with the rule. It's back down a little bit. And there's some really great things that, you know. I think there's there's some things that could have been in there that aren't. Uh, I really like the fact that treating it like a license plate. So if you think about it, you know, I can go outside and collect license plates all day. Mm-hmm. And other other than probably figuring out when you were born because of the month it was re- renewed and where you mm-hmm. live based on the uh, the state you're in and maybe your interest, because if you get a Reno Air Race or a Rodeo, I might know you like Reno Air Races or the Rodeo. Mm-hmm. I don't really get a lot of information about you. Yeah. Right. And and the fact that that's the way they're treating the remote ID database is a really good thing. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, there was there was some desire to have, you know, your certificate number and your name and all this information. And and that's just crazy. Yeah. You, you know, uh, the example I, I used in one of one of my arguments was, you know, if there's a white van parked out front of my house every day with the same license plate three days in a row, mm-hmm. I'm going to get upset. <laughs> if it's a different license plate every day, I might not notice or I might not really care because. It's somebody's van, but they that's sure less. Get creepy. a lot of flowers, huh? Yeah, you know, that's, <laughs> right. That, that's less creepy to me than the same thing every day, and you're just sitting there at one spot. You know, that plumber's been out there for five days. What's going on? Yeah. Right. So, those sort of things, um, and and same thing with around airports. You know, people look at oh, the helicopter's flying overhead every day, right? Because the airport's right over your house, and it has to fly over your house to land. There's nothing yeah. nefarious going on, right? Right. So so we had to deal with a bunch of that. And and I think that's the the big fear about, you know, if you're familiar with uh, see it, click it, fix it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, there is a, a there is a good possibility, depending on how it's implemented, someone will create an app like that where, you know, anytime a drone flies over, somebody can complain that it's trespassing or you're spying on me. Mm-hmm. And we'll have to deal with with that type of, of spurious, uh, you know, nuisance kind of complaints and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. But. You know, I, I'm pretty happy with where the remote ID rule ended up. Oh wow! Yeah, no, I I want to I want to talk more, man. I got I got we could do easily do another hour. <laughs> there is one thing I did want to make sure made it made it over to YouTube, uh, and that was the bit about flying over people. Um, we now we kind of talked a little bit about the license uh, uh, stuff, but you mentioned that there were uh, some safety driven equipage requirements. So what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the really easy answer is if you're going to fly over people. Uh, you can't. You, you have to have protections around the propellers. It, it can't cause lacerations and cuts. Mm. Uh, should it hit anybody? Uh, when it when it does hit somebody, there's a an impact damage that it has to be uh, able to meet or be less than. You know, so depending on what type of category you're looking for, you have to meet those requirements. If you think of it like airbags mm-hmm. and and helmet laws and that sort of thing, it's the same kind of idea. Uh, and they're treated really the same way that, you know, once you have a system that's rated to that, then you're then you're good. You can go fly. Uh, mm-hmm. you're, you don't have to go chase down a waiver anymore. But if you are found to be in violation, right, like just like you're not you know, you're driving around without your helmet on, mm-hmm. you, you, you've got to pay the price. But, you know, it, it works in there. Um, there's some clarification about uh, moving vehicles mm-hmm. and, and how, you, how to fly over them. Uh, there is still a restriction about open air assemblies, so you can't fly over Raider Stadium and that sort of thing where there's thousands of people in, in very high density. Mm. You know, that still requires a little extra work. Um, I was going to say, yeah, what do they do for like concert videos and stuff like that? That's special. And and there is a there is a way to do it. You just have to, 
you have to go above and beyond what's in the basic rule. Hmm. Interesting. Right. And we do that with airplanes already. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you want to fly a helicopter, you know, a hundred feet over a, a concert, you have to get a special approval for that. If you're at 500 feet, you're okay. Uh, so this is going to be very similar to that. Hmm. Yeah. And there's restrictions, like if you're near an airport or something like that. Right. Oh yeah. That and, and a lot of, I think you point out that, you know, there's the, there was some talk about you have to notify people. And, and that's where moving vehicle come in. So if you're not a, a certified system and, it, and it's sort of a part of the self-certified, self-compliance ones, uh, they do have some additional rules where you have to let people know. And there are situations where, you know, if, if you're flying up and down a highway, people have to know. And that can be as simple as a, a sign on the highway saying patrolled by drone aircraft mm. and low flying aircraft. It could be as, as complicated as. Uh, you know, a briefing for everybody who's who's involved and and they're all playing a part. So uh, all of that still, you know, as they're they're working through the the first type certifications, what that's going to look like, uh, we'll see a little more clarity on that. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we got all kinds of stuff I haven't even thought of getting to. <laughs> My goodness, we get, we got to have you back at some point. Uh, yeah, no but, problem. Uh, Gorgie's gone wild in the chat. Says uh, I want to make sure I get this in uh, during the, the the main show here. I'm curious if, if any federal state laws exist to protect privacy when you place a fence to give your home privacy, uh, but someone has their drone looking over your fence because in public your face can be seen, but when is when it's your personal residence, where's the line drawn? That's a, that's a good question. Right. So there's there's a lot of that. So first thing is I'm not an attorney, nor do I play one on TV. Right. Um, but uh, there's a lot of case law on that, and it starts with a case called Cosby, where uh, you know start trying to figure out what what the aerial space and usable space, navigable airspace is, and, and those sort of things. And Cosby had a a bunch of chickens who, when the airport expanded their runway, the airplanes coming into land were scaring his chickens. They were killing chickens. He wanted to sue the government for it, and mm -hmm. and there was a lot of a lot of federal rules came out of that. Uh, that's built out to a whole bunch of things since we started putting helicopters on there for surveillance and. Uh, and basically anything flying over 500 feet can take whatever pictures it wants. If it's a helicopter, if it's an airplane over a thousand feet. Hmm. And that's most people aren't aware of that as a, a privacy issue in Nevada. We actually have a, a 200 foot buffer where you can, you can make a file, a civil complaint about aerial trespass. If somebody is within 200 feet of your property, you know, directly over your property under 200 feet mm -hmm. uh, above the ground. It is, you know, there are some exemptions where, you know, like law enforcement can say too bad, we're not trespassing, we're law enforcement. If I'm landing at an airport, you don't get to say you're trespassing. There, there's some things that are tied to that. Yeah. Um, but every state treats it differently. And that's one of the things that uh, that, that we're, we're actually seeing on, on UAS expanding again is that in the air, it's the FAA's problem. On the ground, it is state and local. Mm -hmm. So there are state and local laws that, you know, and, and even HOAs, uh, FAA brings that up frequently. If an HOA says you cannot take off and land from within their, the development, yeah. that is legitimate. Oh, wow. And if you, and then you can't go, well, I have the FAA telling me I can. No, mm -hmm. FAA says you've, you know, once you're in the air, you're under us, but until you pulled off the ground, you had to follow their rules. You just broke it. Okay. So, so there is there is a little bit of that where it is very important to know, and there's some tools out there that are free and and other ones that go on subscription that will keep you from violating those sort of things. Wow, it's it's an interesting discussion though about privacy because like some of the technical things and the the question earlier about RC planes and helicopters, it's not really a new problem. People just think it's a new problem because um, it's so much easier now. But I mean, you could put, I mean, 20 years ago, I had a friend who was into kite photography and, you know, he'd, he'd put his, his cameras on kites and fly them and in, in Santa Cruz. And, you know, he could take pictures of people's backyards. No problem. Mm -hmm. Same issue. It's just now a lot easier. The right. And, are I, lower. and that's actually one, been one of the challenges for the RC world is, you know, this isn't a hundred, 200 hours of you with balsa and blueprints and and doing all the great homemade stuff and, and doping fabric and right. you know wow what a great thing this was i had a hundred bucks for my stimulus check i'm going to drive by best buy and yeah. i'll be flying this afternoon yeah <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. and head on over to friendlies and yeah yeah you know and right and, and gopros are you know you get a gopro 3 for 100 bucks and you've got a pretty decent camera and you can go do all this stuff and or, or even that, that's just an optic camera, right? So, yeah. you know, the fact that we have access to infrared and, 
you know, time oh, of wow. flight cameras and all kinds of stuff now. Yeah. Uh, you know, that is, we're just not used to dealing with that. Most people are under, are assume that they've got uh, some level of, of privacy. They don't on a note, there is a, a city in Southern Nevada mm-hmm. that has infrared cameras and co- collects biometrics using infrared of people just walking down the street. Hmm. Most people aren't aware that's happening. Oh, wow. So we have this expectation that of, you know, hey, I'm private. I'm doing this. No, there's really unless you're in your house and, yeah. you know, or in your backyard in a way that, you know, a reasonable person couldn't see you. You don't really have the privacy you think you have. And and that's where most people get upset about it. They didn't realize it's not there and it's yeah. too late. Yeah. Uh, Gorgie's Gone Wild also says, uh, I would think that might conflict with peeping laws because of having fences and being able to reasonably protect your privacy. Yeah, even if someone's not directly over your property, if they've yeah. got a side-mounted camera. So, so as somebody who has to deal with constant trespassing on the ground, right? Yeah. So we, we have a challenge with that at our, at our airport where, you know, any of the airports we've actually tried to, to work on in Nevada, you know, people cutting down fences, people just running over gates. Mm. You know, my favorite video I showed the police was the guy who pushed over the sign that said no trespassing so he could drive his motorbike to go drive around behind the, the fence. Um, those are really hard to prosecute with even with that type of, of you know, proof Why and, and evidence. Um, I think it's I, I don't know if I want to comment on that. Okay. Right. <laughs> um it's a lot easier if there's theft than damage, right? You can point to something and go, this is it. It's a lot harder uh, afterwards. So when it gets down to the aerial trespass and the peeping Tom, yes, if if someone's peeping in your house and they're taking pictures of you naked and they're putting it up on YouTube, um, that, is, that is great because they you can hit them with that. And yeah. in Nevada, there are very specific laws about that and you can nail them. It has nothing to do with drones or not. It has to do with the, what they did. The the hard part is when the only thing that you're going to complain about is because they're they're in a drone that's the tough one if they're mm-hmm. violating the other laws you got it and and enjoy and go to town and get your attorneys and and get them for all you can yeah. wow <laughs> right yeah. uh and, and there's a lot of people who don't don't understand that either oh. all right so uh any any final thoughts before we head on over to the post game <laughs> uh no this would be great uh, yeah, i yeah. i could draw on for hours so <laughs> we, we got we got one of those we got at least one more hour I don't know if I don't know if Jed's gonna make it, but but we'll 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 sure go. We'll try. Stick around for a few minutes, but awesome, probably can't awesome. make the whole hour. Well, Got yeah, it. I de- and well, and and actually, I did definitely want to hear from you, Jed, about uh, you know some of the technical stuff. So hopefully, we'll be able to get into that. Um, but so yeah, so just so everybody knows, uh, we're yeah, going to be heading over to the post game here in just a quick second. Uh, if uh, and we'll be talking about all kinds of stuff, we'll be talking about uh, my least favorite drone of all time. Uh, how long you have to wait until you, uh, uh, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that in the post game. Gorgie's, uh, Gorgie says, uh, uh, what is the coolest or most interesting thing you've seen someone do with a drone that you can talk about? We'll get to that in the post game. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, how long you have to wait before spoiling things? Um, <laughs> and all kinds stops. of other stuff. Like what's that? 20 minutes stops. 20 minutes tops. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, no, it's longer than that. Six okay. months. So we're going to, oh my God. Okay. So we'll talk about that here in just a quick second. Now, if you're watching us on YouTube, number one, have a great weekend. And uh, number two, uh, you're about to see a picture of uh, a video of me from about six months ago telling you what you missed. So here it is right now. Hi, I'm the Mighty Pong, host of the show that you just got done watching. Hey, if you'd like to see the entire show and not just the first hour, make sure that you watch on twitch.tv forward slash sin shop every Friday night for the main show. And on Monday nights, we have our special project night. So you can join us, build something, and uh, basically throw stuff at us while we try to concentrate on things. It's a lot of fun. Kind of. But hey, anyway, we hope to see you there. It's a lot of fun. Uh, Yeah, so join us over there, twitch.tv forward slash sin shop. I am, of course, the Mighty Pong, and we will see you there. One take. Not one take.